Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. We're starting our weekend with watches, and everything is for sale. For pricing, reach out to me directly, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. That is my email address. We also look to build inventory all year long. Buy, trade, or sell. Trade a watch you're not wearing for one you will, or sell us your collection. We will buy an entire collection. No upper limit on value paid. We pay cash. We pay fast. We make the process seamless and guide you through it. To buy, trade, or sell, reach out to me, as always, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. Let's start with a watch that represents outstanding value, a versatile all-rounder. This is the Omega Seamaster Aqua Terra. Now, the Aqua Terra is the all-rounder in the collection. No dive bezel, and as you can see, a direct descendant of the original 1948 Seamaster, which wasn't a hardcore sports watch or a diver. It was a water-resistant all-around watch for a man. And this is certainly that, though at 38 millimeters in diameter, only 12.4 millimeters thick, this is one of the most compact unisex Omega options you will find. The watch is under 46 millimeters from lug to lug and one of the few sub 13 millimeter thick automatic Omega watches I've encountered in years. Throw it on the wrist, you can see how short it is across the wrist. Easy to wear on a small wrist, beautifully sized, easily slipping underneath a dress cuff. And you can see that it sits beautifully with high legibility thanks to a silver white dial and blackened indices with hands to match. We have a full deployment clasp, a lovely anthracite colored alligator leather strap with a contrasting stitch. It is basically impervious to magnetism as a master chronometer over 15,000 gauss anti-magnetic and 150 meters water resistant. Flip it all over. Automatic caliber 8800, 55 hour power reserve, coaxial, chronometer, everything a COSC chronometer is, but tested in six positions, fully cased up with winding efficiency, power reserve, shock resistance, and anti-magnetism evaluated in addition to chronometry. Stop seconds, quick set date, full balance bridge, free sprung balance for shock tolerance, a rotor bearing rather than a jeweled staff for better shock resistance of the winding system, and a tri-level coaxial direct and indirect impulse, double impulse escapement, which I believe is still the most sophisticated escapement you can buy for under $50,000. We'll do a quick loom shot, and as you can see, plenty of luminescence and all three hands loomed the way it should be. Now, zoom out and consider another white dial, luxury three option. I often call the trio of Rolex, Breitling, and Omega, the Luxury Three. We've got our Holy Trinity. This is the Luxury Trinity. And while many will consider Omega and Rolex to be peers, this watch from Rolex is a little bit of an underdog by Rolex standards. So compared to the subs and the GMTs and the Daytonas of the world, the Milgauss maybe doesn't get its due, but that's changing, particularly with discontinued and cult classic models like this white dial 116 400. Now, this model was made from 2007 to 2014 when it was discontinued with the arrival of the Z-Blue, and the dial is truly white. It's not silver white like other Rolex references. It is chalk matte white. We have orange indices, numerals, lightning bolt seconds hand, and Milgauss script, and believe it or not, the lightning bolt seconds hand is not a postmodern flourish. The orange color is, but that lightning bolt was present on the original 1950s Milgauss 6543, and you can see right here, two different colors of loom on the dial. That's a rarity in the world of Rolex. Now, while it's Milgauss by name, it is far more than that, in fact. Yes, you do have the soft iron inner cage to channel electromagnetic flux around the escapement and the hairspring, but the reality is the combination of an anti-magnetic balance, balance staff escapement, and a neobium zirconium hairspring makes this watch thousands of Gauss anti-magnetic. So not mil Gauss, not 1,000, thousands, plural. How many? We don't know quite how many, but we know it is thousands today. Now, the watch is 100 meters water resistant, 40 millimeters in diameter and stainless steel, and fairly trim as modern Rolex watches go. As you can see, it's an oddity in the current Rolex lineup in that the end links of the bracelet barely project beyond the lugs, so the lug-to-lug -lug dimension is fairly close to the actual distance across the wrist. And you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it wears beautifully. Chronometer certified, highly anti-magnetic, shock resistant, automatic winding with a 48 hour power reserve, 
Again, 100 meters of resilience against water. It is a very versatile watch. It's got a five millimeter click in, click out, easy link, tool free adjustment system for on the fly adjustments to the fit. A lovely piece that's gaining a lot of momentum on secondary markets because sometimes we only realize how much we love a Rolex when it's no longer available. Okay, sticking with our sports watch theme, but going up market, while I love Rolex, I adore Moser. I would say I, I respect, I revere Rolex. I, I don't necessarily have that heartthrob infatuation that I have with smaller and more obscure brands, but with Moser, it's definitely love. And with this model launched in 2020, it was a love at first sight, 12 millimeters thick, 40 millimeters in diameter. This is the Moser Streamliner Center Second, and it has what they call a matrix green smoked dial. Now, a lot of fans of Moser call this the Green Dragon. It's long since discontinued continued and sold out. In fact, its successor, the Salmon Dial, is also on the verge of being sold out. And it's great because it channels the spirit of the 70s. You can see pieces of different watches and influences from different models in this watch, but you don't look at it and say, oh, that's a Royal Oak or that's a Nautilus. This is very much its own thing. Maybe there's a little bit of Ebel Sport Classic in the bracelet, that Ebel Sport Classic with that wonderfully integrated close coupled set of links. You can see maybe some Omega Speed Sonic chronograph, and then of course, maybe Oris Cronoris Star in the tonneau case with the lapping machine, radio grain, maybe some of the middle of the Mark series chronographs. But this watch is still very much its own thing as it all comes together. It has global light loom on the dial. That's ceramic based loom. I'll show you what that looks like. The watch is 120 meters water resistant. And you can see how beautifully finished the bracelet is. The bracelet has these wonderful polished recesses that sit in between the links. On the reverse side, you can see we have the HMC 200 movement, automatic winding, three-day power reserve, nicely decorated. My favorite feature, the double-striped Cote de Genève. Full balance bridge, free sprung balance for toughness and Moser making the hairspring, the balance, and the escapement the toughest parts to make of a movement beaten away at three hertz. And again, bi-directional winding of a three-day power reserve. It has a bi-directional pole-based magic lever style winding system with ceramic bearings. We'll throw it on my wrist. It looks bigger than it is. It's actually quite compact. Being only 12 millimeters thick, it's competitive with a lot of Rolex watches. And you can see how short it is across the wrist. The bracelet splays out on each side. The case itself, is barely longer across the wrist than the watch is in diameter. So let's say lug to lug, this is gonna be somewhere around 42 millimeters across the wrist, wearing really nice. I love those applique polished indices. They add a lot of definition to the dial. And personally, I like indices to more easily tell the time and of course precisely set the time on my watches. Alango und Zona set a new mark for both movement finishing and innovation with the 1999 Dotograph. So what do you do when it comes time to update a legend? I apologize for my fingerprints here, but I was kind of all over this watch. I love Langa. This is the update to the seminal 1999 Dotograph. This is the Dotograph Up Down, released in 2012. It's now 41 millimeters rather than 39. It has a power reserve indicator on the dial, whereas previously there was none. And it features a 60 hour power reserve where previously the power reserve was 36. Now you can see the power reserve index moving as I wind the watch. It is a flyback chronograph, which means you can time events that occur in rapid succession. When you get to the point that you need to reset, you reset and restart all in one action. No need to stop, reset and restart with the flyback. The action is instantaneous. The dial is made of sterling silver and then galvanized black. The frame for the date, the hands, the indices, all of those are white gold. And perhaps surprisingly for a dress watch, it is fairly well loomed. Flip it all over. By the way, you can see this platinum case imposing in its scope and equipped with an optional extra, rarely seen on the Dotograph, a full matching deployant clasp in platinum. This watch comes with a pin buckle, so someone opted to go all in for a few thousand bucks at the dealer 
and upgrade his watch with this buckle, and the next owner will be the beneficiary. Flip it over. This is the caliber L9516, the sixth revision of the movement that originally bowed in 99. Lots to highlight here. You can see the combination of the column wheel and the lateral clutch. We have jewels set in golden chiton, themselves fixed into the bridges by blued screws. Note we have both black polished and fire blued screws. The golden parts of the movement are nickel, copper, zinc, with the copper giving them the golden hue. That's the material known as German silver. All these silver parts that are silvery white are made of steel. You can see they're satinated or black polished on their top and mirror beveled on their edge. The same is true of the German silver bridges. Black polished swan's neck, fine adjustment mechanism. Take a look, another change from the original datagraph. The Balance is now free sprung and variable inertia. We still have an overcoil hairspring and a 2.5 hertz beat rate. Column wheel feel here is divine and outstanding. And you will note there's an instantaneous minute jumper with a pole and wheel. The clutch itself features both sharp inward angles where bevels meet and sharp outward points where bevels come to a point. All of this very impressive. And of course, we have a wonderful push button system so you can toggle the panorama datum, which believe it or not, began life as a JLC patent that was given to Langa as a gesture of friendship in the early 1990s. This is a monster. And I want to assure you that it still fits fine on a smaller wrist. On my wrist of 16 centimeters circumference, I can wear the Dotto up down or the original Dotto. It's purely a matter of whether you want the extra power reserve, complication, and again, this huge upcharge addition, the full clasp that really makes this watch a little bit unusual, almost unique as most of these do feature a pin buckle rather than a clasp. Okay, I'm going to show you something very simple and then something monstrously complicated. If you've ever heard of the crash de Cartier, you know two things. One, its origin is shrouded in macabre mystery. Originally, the idea was that a London Cartier executive, back when there were New York, London, and Paris Cartier branches operating independently, well, they said back in 1967, one of the London executives was involved in a massive car crash and... His watch melted on his wrist, and this was the result, and so they created the crash via that inspiration. Well, that is fun as a story, unless you're the guy, but it's probably not true. That said, since 1967, that was year one for the Cartier crash. It has always been a very limited watch, made in short production runs, always kept exclusive and very expensive, and this from 1991 was one of the periodic limited runs. Uh, you could see this was made by Cartier in Paris. It was not a Swiss product. It was not a product of the New York or the London branch, but this was properly speaking a Paris-made Cartier crash with manual wind mechanical movement from a 1991 edition of 400 pieces. It has all of the characteristic elements, the exotic case construction. You can see the assembly screws going through the side, the remarkable contouring. It has the cabochon. It has the broadsword hands. It has the fluid melted flowing set of Roman numerals with the Cartier secret signature. And it's actually quite compact. It's only 38.5 millimeters from, I guess you could call it lug to lug, and only 22.5 millimeters across. And it is approximately nine millimeters thick. Inside is a Cartier caliber 160, which is a mechanical manual wind movement. So this is not quartz. Now, of course, traditionally, the crash was always a compact watch. Here we have a modern version of the famed deployant clasp originally invented by Louis Cartier in 1909. That was the first ever folding clasp for a wristwatch. So we have even a historic clasp with a historic model here. Now I'll throw it on my wrist and you can see that the watch is designed to be discreet and compact. A lot of folks see pictures of the crash and they imagine that it must be huge because of the unusual shape. In fact, it is quite petite. It'll wear well on a male or a female wrist and perhaps what was considered to be unisex by the standards of 1991 is a bit quaint today. But then again, you're staring at a legend. and. I haven't been able to determine what the crystal is made of, though I strongly sense it's either mineral or plexiglass, because to the touch, it's a lot warmer than a sapphire crystal. So this watch shrouded in all kinds of mystery and an absolute stunner. This is a very simple watch, about as cool as any two-hand timepiece could ever be. And again, not quartz, mechanical, manual wind, a 400-piece, 1991 limited edition of a legendary model. Now, something 
very complicated. And I do mean very complicated. Launched in 2005 in 50 pieces in rose gold. There were also 50 in white gold. This is the Arnold & Son True North Perpetual. 45 millimeters in rose gold with welded on lugs with straps fixed by screws and bars with a running equation of time as well as an indexed equation of time. It is a perpetual calendar with a pointer date, coaxial leap year and month, power reserve indicator for the seven day manual wind power reserve. And then you can see how I'm able to set the longitude down at the bottom. Now, what our equation of time does is it shows you the difference between solar noon and true noon. It shows you the difference between solar time and mean clock time all the time, but the easiest way to understand it is at noon. Solar noon is the time when the sun is directly overhead, but every point within a time zone doesn't have the exact same moment of solar noon, as you will see the sun overhead at different times in different places within one time zone. So in order to get mean time for one time zone, we take the average of all the times in that zone. You know that from east to west in a time zone, the sun's in different places at different times. So clock time is that mean time, that time we agree is the one and only time throughout a time zone, whereas solar noon is going to be much more dependent on your specific longitude. So what this watch does is it shows you the difference between the two, and that difference typically ranges from plus 15 minutes to minus 15 minutes year-round, and it coincides four times a year. So now what happens here is if you set this watch to winter time or standard time, you set the equation of time, the running equation of time correctly, and then you set the longitude what happens if you point the equation of time at the sun at true solar noon is that this little index, true north, will point to true north. So by using the equation of time and the position of the sun, you can use this watch to gauge true geographical north. On the reverse side, you can see the movement is handsomely decorated. The bevels, as you can see, are impressive. The Cote de Genève are high grade, and we have solarization across several of the barrels associated with the winding system. An awesome timepiece that includes a full clasp and one of the most complex watches I've ever encountered. This is almost like one of the high celestial complications from Patek Philippe, and you can see it wears broad at over 56 millimeters lug to lug. This watch only wears right on a wrist of 17 centimeters circumference or larger, though as you can see, it's not overly thick, but it is beautifully built and monstrously complicated. Two equations of time, a power reserve of seven days, and a perpetual calendar, and only 50 of these manufactured or I should say, lovingly handcrafted in La Chaux de Fonds. Hodinke has done several collaborations with Resence, which is a Swiss-Belgian hybrid. The watches are designed in Belgium, built in Switzerland. Back in 2017, Hodinke, the American watch blog, did this with Resence, a 20-piece stainless steel limited edition. This is the Resence Type 1H, H for Hodinke. A couple of different things. It's half a millimeter smaller than a typical Type 1, so 41.5 millimeters. You can see instead of the wire lugs, it has conventional lugs. All of it is satin polished for a more subdued look. You can see the sapphire arcs out over the edge of the case. And the watch is nice and thin, or only 12 millimeters. Now the dial is made of German silver, but it has a nickel anthracite coating. The movement total is 40 joules. The ETA 2824 base only has 25 joules. So with over 100 parts and 15 joules, this Resence Orbital Convex System dial module is very much a second movement atop the movement. This is Resence's watch making contribution to the project. Crownless, you could see it's set and, if you wish, wound using the case back, though it is an automatic winder. Now you can see how, turning the case back here, I am able to rotate the indication of time. And it is a regulator. Actually, we have a seven-day indicator, seven days, seven semicircles, or seven arcs, I should say. Take a quick look. Now you can see that the minute hand is pointing to 60, the hour hand is pointing to 1, and you can see that the day hand is just slightly past the middle of the second solid arc. That means we are looking at 1 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon. So that's how you read the watch. 
Now take a quick look in the dark. It does have a surprising amount of loom, though it is the black variety of Super Luminova, and it fades fairly quickly. But in some ways, it's easier to see the dial. You can see how everything moves in concert, rotating on its own axis, but also relative to each other. And you can see that it's also a regulator, as we have our seconds right here, we have our minutes right here, and then we have our hours down at the bottom. So by separating the three, we also get a regulator dial. And it has an automatic winding 36-hour power reserve. It's got three straps, shell cordovans, so a horse hide leather strap. It's also got a Rescence gray strap in leather and a textile strap with Velcro, plus a Rescence frisbee that comes with the boxed set. Yes, a plastic Rescence frisbee. And although it is 49 millimeters lug to lug, because it is so thin and so light on the wrist, it'll wear on a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference, maybe even 14, and I'm really enjoying the fit and the feel of this one. Okay, jumping straight into something very different. We're talking about collaborations between American-based companies in the watch space and Swiss independents. Well, Hodinkee had its resins here. Oster Jewelers of Denver has created a 10-piece limited edition with Arm & Strom from the System 78 collection here. We have the Rescence Gravity Equal Force. Now, what you have here is a 41 millimeter watch with a motor barrel, like a pocket watch, where the barrel arbor actually drives the time rather than the toothed edge of the barrel. It also has a stop works where we have a power reserve indicator sitting on top of a Maltese cross stop works. So the power reserve indicator keeps track of your 72 hour power reserve, which is wound either manually or using this micro rotor up at the top. The 72 hour power reserve is only the middle of the mainsprings wind. So in theory, this could run for about one third longer than it does. But by cropping off the beginning of the power curve of the mainspring when the power is surging and the torque is very high and cropping off the end when the torque begins to drop too low, Armstrong has created a completely flat torque curve, achieving constant force from the barrel to the escapement without the use of a remontoir, a differential, or a fuse. So we have a constant force system here that does not include bulky and complex and expensive secondary devices. And this is very clever. The stop works will prevent the watch from running at the extremes of its mainspring wind. You can also see guilloche on the base plate and then on the dial as well as Kerry Voudelainen completed the guilloche, actually created the designs and completed the work on this model. 41 millimeters in rose gold. This gravity equal force is a 10 piece limited edition from Oster. And you can see a number of little elements. What at first glance appears like it might be thread on the strap is actually a small braided wire of rose gold on each side. And then it is a custom Jean Rousseau strap made in Paris. Jean Rousseau is among others, the OEM supplier to FP Journ. So you see alligator leather in a lovely faded blue that perfectly matches the dial. Take a look at the finishing here. Look at these sharp interior creases where the bevels meet. One, two, three, four, five, six. Turn it all over. Seven, eight. Many different finishes here. A free sprung balance for durability. You can see it is one out of 10. The beveling on the bridges is outstanding, but then we also have media blasting, brushed satination, Cote de Genève, and engine turned perlage. It is a beautifully decorated watch, and it even includes a little plaque at the bottom. People ask, why do these Armstrong watches include the so-called chin? Uh, that's actually a platform for engraving and customization if you wish to personalize the watch. Now, at 41 millimeters, the watch does wear easily. It's fairly thin, though it's sheer in case profile, and it fits easily on my wrist. Constant force, power reserve indicator, stop works, carry Voudelaine and Guilloche, 10-piece limited edition, and movement finish that is second only to very, very elite few. This is an outstanding example of independent watchmaking at its best. Today, though, I'm going to end with two monsters from Vacheron Constantin, and they are both very simple watches, maybe even deceptively simple. In 1955, Vacheron Constantin turned 200, then, as now, the oldest continuously operating Swiss watch manufacturer, and, of course, it was ripe for 
commemoration. So for 200 years, they released the anniversary reference 6099, powered by a then brand new ultra thin manual wind caliber 1003, itself developed by JLC for Vacheron and Audemars Piguet. And this watch debuted in late 2009 for the 2010 model year. It is the historique ultra plat and it is the 1955 tribute. The historique ultra plat 1955 is 36 millimeters in diameter in rose gold. As I measure it, it is only 4.1 millimeters thick with a super sophisticated case construction and an incredibly compact 42.2 millimeter lug to lug span. Flip it over and you can see the modern day descendant of that original caliber 1003. This is the 1003 slash 4, and there have been some upgrades. First and foremost, the movement is now made of solid 18 karat gold. You can see on the bridges, just like F.P. Journe, the movement is made of solid gold. Unlike F.P. Journe, the movement is also Geneva Hallmark. So, ultra thin at 1.64 millimeters thick this movement is intricately finished and immaculately decorated yet still five position adjusted look at the solarization the stripes the mirrored beveling the inward angles the outward angles the engine turning look at the black polish on the extended regulator index and the geneva style stud holder look at the solarization on the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel core the black polish of the click and the click spring this is as good as it gets. And being 36 millimeters, it is quite a bit larger than the original reference 1699, which was 32. I've reviewed that reference elsewhere on the channel. Here you can see that the modern size would wear well on a man's wrist or a woman's wrist. It's just not as crushingly tiny as the original. That said, it is incredibly short. You can see it almost disappearing underneath my wrist hair. This is Vacheron at its finest. And you'll also note Geneva Hallmark on the case, as well as the movement, is since mid-2012, it has been a full wide standard for fine finish. Now, in the early 2000s, Vacheron launched the Malt Collection. At the time, not a collection of tonneau cases, as it would later become, but a collection defined by lovely flared and stepped lugs. This is the Malt Skeleton, 35.5 millimeters in diameter in yellow gold. It is under six millimeters thick. You can see it has beautiful welded on lugs in a handcrafted case, framing caliber 1120, also based on a historic JLC Abauch, originally designed in 1967 for Vacheron, Patek, and Audemars Piguet, the movement has never been used by any other company, including JLC. Here you can see the action of the keyless works winding the mainspring inside a fully skeletonized barrel with the Vacheron Maltese Cross logo. You could see the mainspring coiling as a sort of informal power reserve indicator. Now I pull the crown out, engaging the crown wheel or the winding pinion, which allows me to, excuse me, or the setting pinion, which allows me to set the motion works at center. So you'll see there is the crown wheel or the setting pinion. The clutch pushes it into contact with the first intermediate wheel which drives the second intermediate, which drives the minute wheel. The minute wheel, via its extended pinion, drives the hour wheel. And then underneath, there is a cannon pinion that holds the minute hand. Absolutely gorgeous. We have one, two, three, four ruby roller bearings that support the full annular that is circular rotor on the back. The mass is only one side, but the rotor goes all the way around, and those rotor supports, those jewels, are only visible on the skeleton versions of the watch through the dial side. They prevent the close coupled ring and rotor from hitting the bridges and plates, so it can be super thin. And this movement was a record setter back in 1967 at only 2.45 millimeters thick. It is still one of the thinnest automatics in the world. You could see even the ratchet wheel's been skeletonized. Everything here that has been skeletonized has simultaneously been freehand engraved, so no two of these are exactly alike. You can see the escapement rocking away on the dial side. Nothing left to the imagination, though it does set the imagination wild. You can also see that the interiors of all these skeletonized parts have been beveled, so there are many, many sharp interior angles where bevels meet. This watch is Vacheron at its finest. Automatic winding with a 40-hour power reserve. You can see how simple it is to wear on any wrist. Super compact. I'm not going to recommend a lower limit for wrist size, because this will wear well on any forearm. If you love 
this watch or any you've seen in today's episode, reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for pricing.